welcome back Fleur community. I hope you're well and having an incredible day as always. And yes, today we're going to be talking about TEE's Trusted Execution Environments. And this is part of the Fleur 2.0 vision. And we're going to first dig in to give a little bit of context into this uh, document here on the Flare Network's official website. We're just going to scroll down and start right here. Introducing trusted execution environments. This is what we're going to be talking about to give context to a short segment of an interview with Hugo um, talking about TEEs and why they're integrated to the Flare Network. So what is a trusted execution environment? A TEE is a secure computing environment isolated within the hardware that shields it from its parent's operating system, thereby preventing tampering or unauthorized access to its memory. For blockchain applications, TEEs offer substantial compute resources with two highly desirable features. First of all, we have confidentiality, which is basically the memory and code running in a TEE cannot be tampered with and important data such as private keys stored in the memory cannot be observed by external entities. The second thing is verifiability. Trusted execution environments can prove that they are executing the correct code. So what does this mean for the Flare network? Well, it means that security and privacy hold private keys to blockchain addresses. So these are, um, sorry, so they securely hold these addresses. <clears throat> Private keys are obviously very sensitive and without being able to look into a TEE, a trusted execution environment, these are very secure. It also means that they can take information, take in information from reliable sources, such as the FTSO, the FDC and Flare system protocol. It can apply it to compute intensive logic expressed as code and produce outputs that can be trusted, both because the data is reliable and because the code's execution can be verified. Finally, we can perform operations with enhanced privacy. Now, I want to scroll down a little bit further here and just go through this diagram, which I think is very useful in uh, understanding how these are going to work with uh, protocol managed wallets, which is something that I am extremely excited about and we will be doing a little bit more on that in the near future. So we have this diagram here. How do protocol managed wallets work? Well, it starts, uh, let me just give you a quick synopsis here. Protocol managed wallets are going to allow people to interact with other networks directly from the Flare network. So Flare will be the hub and they can execute transactions on the XRP ledger, Bitcoin, Litecoin, Dogecoin, whatever the integrated chain may be, but they can do it directly from the Flare network. And this is something we call chain abstraction, abstracting the complexities of having to configure and connect to different networks away from the user. The user is on the Flare network and they can interact with all of the integrated networks through protocol managed wallets. Here's how it works. You first start with the protocol PMWs, which sends payments and instructions over to various smart contracts that are obviously hosted onto the Flare network. Configuration within these smart contracts then sends instructions to the data providers or the infrastructure providers. And this is the first round of decentralization, I guess. Basically, all of the data providers reach a consensus and validate these instructions, and then they relay them to the trusted execution environments. And yes, there is more than one. Hugo, in the segment that you will see in just a moment, said that there may be up to 20. The trusted execution environments then execute the instructions and basically sign off the results which will eventually result in a transaction on an external network than Flare. So that's how it works in a nutshell. Let's listen to Hugo and see what he has to say on trusted execution environments and why they are so important to the Flare network. Okay, uh, trusted execution environment, they're an isolated chip where 
um, effectively no one can read the memory of the chip or see you know what is happening within the chip okay. um, and this is the same kind of chip that you use in your phone uh, that does facial recognition and allows your phone to uh, to, to, to be used uh, but when when it looks at your face um, and so ultimately what's really important about TEs from a crypto perspective is you can put software in it and no one else can tamper with that software. Mm -hmm. And you can verify that the software has run and that that very specific set of software has run and it has run correctly. Um, and that's why TEs are interesting because it gives you verifiability over software that you either don't want to run on chain or you couldn't run on chain. For instance, give you like a super simple uh, understanding of this. You want to put an LLM uh, in a way that's verifiable. You can't run it on chain. Can't run an LLM on chain, not with billions or trillions of parameters. Um, you know, there's nowhere near enough memory for that. Run it in a TE, uh, and you can be certain that the LLM that was uploaded to that TE is the same LLM with the same set of parameters when you go to use it. So if we think of kind of chains as these trusted execution environments, then a TEE is a way to kind of extend out that, that environment. Well, it can be used that way, but only if you design it really sensibly. Because one of the things that TEE doesn't have is it doesn't have decentralization. It doesn't have liveness, right? So we're not using one TEE. When you go and look at projects, most people are using one, mm. one TEE, right? Um, we're not using one TE, we're not using two. We're probably going to end up using 10 to 20, uh, of which there's, you, you know, we could have 50% go down and not have an issue. Um, so, you, because you want liveness, that's what you want blockchains for. You want them for a lack of sensorability, decentralization, and that they're always available. Um, and so, just using a TE in isolation, that's not interesting. We're building a TE compute layer. Mm -hmm. which can have many TEs with checkpoints so that you can have redundancy, so you can have failover, so that if there's a financial application that people are using and one of the TEs goes down, uh, it switches the, it routes the uh, compute to a different TE, which knows where you are uh, in terms of where you are in terms of the, the kind of transactions you're doing, uh, what, the, what it knows the state of the application and all that kind of stuff. So it can, it can understand uh, you know, it can fail over very quickly. Right. So it's almost a, it's another component of the network built on top of the exactly, existing network. exactly. Um, but it gives you the ability to do for you know huge compute. Importantly for us, because they are secret or that they have privacy, um, it gives you the ability to hold a private key. So TE can hold a private key, mm -hmm. which means that TE can be part of a TE only multisig, uh, and that multisig can respond only to events from chain uh, and that's critical right so it gives you we our interoperability the way we'll be holding funds on other chains that'll be through a conventional multi-sig method but it's not like a normal multi-sig it's not where me and you call up each other and go we need to sign this transaction the transaction can only be signed on a valid output from a protocol on flag so that is trusted execution environments which are basically setting the foundation for Hugo's vision of Fleur 2.0, which will unlock protocol managed wallets and allow Fleur to interact with multiple networks, external networks directly from the Fleur network. This is absolutely incredible, exciting stuff. I would like to thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please feel free to share it, like, and subscribe. Have yourself a wonderful day. And until next time, I'm out. For mission control, we have liftoff.